Hi, this is Kendall Boyson, professional life and recovery coach, and you're listening to Encouragementology, the practice of instilling hope. Hi there. Thanks for joining me. On this show, we aim to tickle your ego, prod your self-importance, and maybe even burst that bubble of self-delusion just a little. Ego, you say? What ego? Well, ego isn't just a one-size-fits-all deal. It's a complex, colorful, and downright funky part of what makes us human. We're going to explore the ego's many faces, from the subtle whispers of self-doubt to the grandiose declarations of, I am the center of the universe. Whether you need to put your ego in check or someone else's, ego plays a multifaceted and important role in our lives. While they can sometimes be associated with negative traits like arrogance or self-centeredness, ego is a fundamental aspect of human psychology. Defined, ego is a person's sense of self-esteem and self-importance. It's the core of our self-identity. It helps us differentiate ourselves from others and develop a sense of who we are as individuals. It's the foundation upon which we build our self-concept, which includes our beliefs, values, and personal narratives. Wow, ego has some pretty big shoulders and shoes to fill. So what happens when it's left unchecked or goes astray? Enter the need for humility. Humility is the absence of ego. A modest or low view of one's own importance humbleness. So how can you strike a healthy balance? Self-awareness. So let's dig in to better understand the differences and the scale to narrow the gap. Over at pathwaystohappiness.com, I found a good introduction about ego. Some people would say that the ego doesn't exist as they have never seen it. That's like a person who claims they don't have a face because they've never seen a mirror. We don't see our faces until we have a self-reflective surface. We need a self-reflective process to see or become aware of our own ego. To foster personal growth, it's essential to introspect deeply, separating elements of your behavior, emotions, and thoughts from your core identity. These facets should be viewed as malleable aspects of your personality, open to transformation, even if the path to change isn't immediately clear. If you look inward and see only stuff you like, you'll identify with all those parts and say, well, this is me. You'll conclude that there are no parts that aren't you. All is you, and there's nothing else there. No ego. This is being hypnotized to believe all the concepts of ego are you. You also have to drop the excuses. Well, this is just the way I am. Or I'm this way because of my parents. These excuses make those parts of your personality appear fixed and unchangeable. You could say that those voices giving the excuses are part of the ego as well. They are narrating a story of self that is unchangeable and helpless. To do this self-reflective looking isn't that complicated. It's only unfamiliar, so a few clarifications will help clear up any obstacles. One is the abstract concept called ego. Most places don't describe the ego in practical terms, so people still aren't sure what to look for. The other complication is that the ego has many manners of expression. A thousand different expressions of the mind can be attributed to the ego. Each expression is just one facet of the ego mind. Consider these questions. A yes indicates the ego mind. Does your mind make criticism or judgments of other people at times? Are there thoughts about yourself being not good enough or unworthy? Do you sometimes have the thought that you're unlovable? Do you sometimes think other people or the world would be better off if they did things your way? Do you sometimes feel other people are stupid or idiots and are frustrated with them? Does this ever come with a feeling of righteousness or moral superiority? 
Do you sometimes feel insecure or afraid people are judging you? Does the idea of public speaking make you nervous? Do you feel a need to defend yourself if someone questions what you're doing? Is it important how others perceive you? Do you feel you have not been sufficiently recognized? Do you fear you will fail or not succeed? Do you fear death? Do you sometimes worry that you won't be or aren't a good parent? Do you sometimes find it difficult to sleep because your mind is busy with thoughts? These questions don't reveal all the facets and layers of the ego. They're merely a start. Answering yes to any of these questions is an indication of ego. It indicates a self-image where you find yourself better or less than others. This is a simple understanding of ego qualities, but it's a start. Another name for ego is self-importance. Some people will look at these questions and say yes to all of them. They might assume that others would say yes to all of them as well. Yes, they are part of almost everyone's personality, and they're still the ego. That is because having an ego is very normal. Everyone develops an ego growing up early in life. The difference later in life is how healthy the ego is or if the ego is destructive and causes misery in your life. It's not uncommon for people to feel the need to alter themselves in order to be accepted by others. This can lead to rejecting aspects of oneself in favor of conforming to societal expectations. Trying to fit in and being accepted at school often involves excelling in certain areas like academics, athletics, or fashion. While this may lead to approval and attention, it can also create a sense of pressure to constantly maintain this standard. Unfortunately, this can also lead to making fun of or rejecting others who don't fit into the same expectations. It's important to value oneself based on personal qualities rather than external factors and to treat others with kindness and acceptance regardless of their differences. If you were cool because of how you looked, then being athletic wouldn't be important. If you were athletic, then maybe you didn't value grades as much as those people that were considered geeks. If you were one of the geeks, you took pride in it and dismissed people who were valued for how cool they looked. You likely adopted a value and belief system that favored your self-image so you would feel better. However, that didn't prevent you from also adopting conflicting value systems that left you feeling unworthy and like a loser. At the same time, you felt good about the value system that made you feel good. You were afraid of being judged by one that caused you to feel rejected. Self-acceptance and self-rejection became automatic parts of your belief system and your ego identity. Over many years, while we were young and impressionable, we had thousands of judgmental thoughts and comments. Every day at school, we had multiple opportunities to compare ourselves to others. Thousands of repetitions of mental thoughts built up a strong belief system about our identity and worth, or lack of it. We made value assessments of how we were good in some areas and not so good in some areas. These false self-images in our mind contributed to our personality, fears, self-judgment, and strengths. Our belief system is shaped by the thoughts we have over time. And this, in turn, creates our identity and sense of self-worth. This is known as the ego. And it's a natural part of socialization. However, there is room for improvement in the way we approach this problem. And taking a step back to reassess our strategy could help us find a more effective solution. Much of what may have driven us towards success can be attributed to ego. So it isn't all bad. As we go through life, we all develop certain aspects of our personality that may seem normal to us. However, it's important to reflect on these traits and ensure they aren't negatively impacting our lives. If you find that certain aspects of your ego have grown to exaggerated levels and are causing you distress, it may be time to take action and work on dismantling those traits. 
Remember, self-reflection and self-improvement are important parts of personal growth and happiness. So an unhealthy ego might appear like this. Incessant critical chatter from the voices in your head. Anger. Insecurity. Anxiety. Conditional love. Need to prove you're right in every situation. Jealousy. Criticism of other people, often accompanied with a sense of superiority. Depression. Need to be perfect or do things perfectly. Feeling not lovable, good enough, or worthy. Feelings of shame, guilt, or fear. Sense of superiority over others. A need to be superior to others. Need for attention from others. If you find yourself experiencing any of these situations or similar ones, it could be a sign that your belief systems are not in harmony with your ego. However, there is hope. These conditions are not irreversible. By addressing the fundamental beliefs that fuel your thoughts, emotions, and actions, you can make a positive transformation. Is having drive egotistical? Hmm. It is hyper-focused on a goal, and most of the time that goal is a personal or professional goal. So, maybe a little. My hungry years were spent trying to establish myself and grow my career. If I think back to that time, sure, I was hyper-focused on getting somewhere. I wasn't very self-aware back then and justified the pace as helpful to everyone else around me. Look at all I'm doing to make all of our lives better without truly understanding what that meant. Phrases like work-life balance was not a thing. Did I want to succeed and be recognized as successful and at the top of my game more than I was really providing a solid foundation for my family? Hmm, yes, to some degree. But as I've always said, you only know what you know. And at the time, it felt like that's what it took to reach the top. Fast forward and hindsight is in my purview. Things look different now, even if time can't be rewritten. Alex Morris explains how your ego is affecting your mental health found at ihasco.co. Everyone has an ego. There are many definitions of the ego, but to put it simply, it's your sense of personal identity or feelings of self-importance. It helps you identify your uniqueness to stand up for yourself and to put plans into action. It is, however, incredibly important that you notice how your ego impacts your decisions as it can be a negative influence. If you think of a time when you've done or said something that had negative consequences, this was your misguided ego at play. Having an awareness of your ego plays a large part in improving your relationships with others, as well as your ability to manage others and yourself. Your ego's job is to feel important. Its survival depends on it. Unfortunately, this translates to your ego needing to fight and defend itself. It seems counterintuitive, but the ego needs negative situations to arise so it can have something to do, something to worry about, or something to change. So if you're happy and everything is perfect, your ego will already be looking for an issue to cling to or drama to create. The ego doesn't live in the present. While it is a fact that only the present moment exists and the past and future exist only in the mind, your ego wants you to be thinking about the past and the future. This means thinking about things that have gone wrong in your past or things that might go wrong in your future. As a rule, every single time you take something personally, this is the work of your ego. This means if you think back to when someone was rude to you, or you felt offended, or you feel superior to them as a result, it's your ego talking. If you worry about an event coming up, it's your ego talking. If you receive some feedback you don't like, regardless of whether it was just or unjust, it's your ego talking. Your ego takes you away from the present moment. Imagine living your whole life thinking about the past and the future and then realizing at the end 
that all you've ever had was the present moment, but you were too stuck in your head to fully engage your senses and enjoy the world around you. So here's how you can identify when your ego kicks in. Have you ever disliked someone succeeding? Do you compare yourself to others? Do you look for attention? Do you see yourself as better, cleverer, or nicer than others? Do you like talking about people's imperfections? Have you ever noticed that your virtue signaling, which is showing off how moral you are, Have you ever looked down on someone for not trying as hard as you? It's perfectly fine to have a sense of self-importance, but it's important to keep it in check. When your ego starts affecting your decision-making, moods, or leads you to feel superior to others, victimized or powerless, it can make you unhappy. Even when you realize this, your ego will resist because it thrives on finding problems to defend itself against. It doesn't like peace and seeks out enemies to feel superior. This prevents you from enjoying life and accepting things as they are. Recognizing when your ego is causing interference and gently bringing it back in line can help you learn to accept things as they are. Most people fully identify themselves with the voice in their head. Have you ever considered the idea that this is not you? but just one part? Over time, you can redefine who you think you are and how you see others. This will help you make better decisions. This is the difference between I'm stupid and sometimes I make stupid decisions. The distinction between these two viewpoints is massive. And with others, for example, he is a lazy person and he's not very engaged are very different. This is essential in management. Good managers believe that everyone is a potential winner and that some are just disguised as losers. Bad managers look down on people. When you get upset or sad or angry or worry or fear the future, this is not you. It's just your ego, just your mind. Our society idolizes the mind without an awareness of its imperfections and traps. If you respond badly on instinct to someone's advice or to a particular situation you're in, remember that it's not you with the problem, but your ego. If you make this small but crucial separation, you will be a lot happier and more level-headed. Your ego is just a part of you. Your mind is just a part of you. Your subconscious makes decisions before you know it. Remember the gut? Mm Mm-hmm. You don't have to think about feeling, breathing, the beating of your heart, or the digestion of your food, your presence in the universe, and your sense of smell, touch, taste, or sound. These are all you, too. You're a lot more than your ego. In Western culture, a child might ask how they came into the world. In Eastern culture, a child might ask how they came out of the world. This highlights the problem we have with how we see ourselves in the world. You are not just a brain and a skull in a bag of skin that will be gone in a few decades. You are part of an intricately connected universe that only exists because of all its parts. The atoms that make up the neurons that allow your brain to think were once in a star and will one day be a star again. Your mind is a small part of the universe that has become self-aware. This is a beautiful quote from Eckhart Tolle. You are not in the universe. You are the universe, an intrinsic part of it. Ultimately, you are not a person, but a focal point where the universe is becoming conscious of itself. What an amazing miracle. How in the world are we this far along and we haven't uttered the word narcissism? I'm sure it's the elephant in the room for many of you. Ego that seems untamable. Inflated egos can rear their ugly heads in a number of ways. Narcissism. 
Excessive ego can manifest as narcissism, a personality trait characterized by an exaggerated sense of self-importance, a constant need for admiration, and a lack of empathy for others. Narcissistic individuals often believe they are superior to others and may manipulate or exploit people to maintain their self-image. It also creates arrogance. Individuals with inflated egos may display arrogance and condescension toward others. They might be little or dismiss the opinions and achievements of others, believing themselves to be superior in every way. Difficulty accepting criticism. Those with out-of-control egos may struggle to accept constructive criticism or feedback. They might become defensive, deny their mistakes, or shift blame onto others rather than acknowledging their flaws or errors. It can also create relationship problems. Excessive egos constrain personal and professional relationships. It may lead to conflicts as individuals with inflated egos often prioritize their own needs and desires over those of others, making cooperation and compromise challenging. Isolation. People with unchecked egos may isolate themselves from others because they believe they're above or beyond the need for social interaction. This isolation can lead to feelings of loneliness and alienation. Impulsivity. An out-of-control ego can lead to impulsive behavior driven by a desire for immediate gratification or recognition. This impulsivity may result in poor decision-making and negative consequences. Unrealistic expectations. Those with inflated egos may set unrealistic goals and expectations for themselves, leading to disappointment and frustration when they're unable to achieve these lofty aims. Vulnerability to criticism. Paradoxically, individuals with fragile egos may react intensely to criticism, even minor or constructive feedback. They might experience emotional distress and engage in defensive behavior to protect their self-esteem. The old Humpty Dumpty crack in the shell, right? It could lead to shallow relationships. People with an out-of-control ego may struggle to form deep, meaningful connections with others as they may view relationships primarily as opportunities for self-validation and self-interest. And an impaired self-awareness, of course. An excessively inflated ego can blind individuals to their own shortcomings and prevent them from seeking personal growth and self-improvement. This lack of self-awareness can hinder personal development. On Christy Evanpole's blog, she explores self-love versus healthy ego. So, Christy said, I found that self-love is not a destination. It's a practice. Self-love is the foundation on which we build a happy life. Without self-love, We have nowhere to put the love or abundance that comes to us. Self-love is taking care of your mind, body, and soul. In that new practice, I found that learning to honor my soul, my highest self, helps me to awaken to my full potential, heal my soul sickness, and reframes my reality. Healthy ego allows us to genuinely appreciate our strengths accept our imperfections, and love ourselves unconditionally. So these are examples of self-love or a healthy ego. Telling what is true for us, not swallowing words that express what we truly feel, think, or want to do. Giving our body the nurturing, rest, exercise, and comfort it needs to the best of our ability. Wearing clothes that make us feel good and fit our personality instead of wearing clothes that are in fashion that we use to impress others. Not waiting for others to do the loving us, but love yourself. Spend quality time with yourself. Date yourself. Marry yourself first. Accepting yourself with the good, the bad, and the ugly, the sexy, and the weird. Making time to do whatever we love just to play, 
without worrying about wasting time. Walk the walk, owning our inner and outer beauty and complimenting ourselves without feeling guilty, arrogant, or entitled. Not rehashing our past mistakes and dragging ourselves to a dark place when we know that we can only learn from the past. We can't change it. Spending quality, connected time with ourselves instead of always watching TV or wasting time on the internet. Using discretion when sharing our heart, self, and dreams with others. Trusting the path that our soul is on and making a genuine effort to become a conscious co-creator of our destiny. Following what our gut says instead of living out of our brain and ego. Staying in our integrity both when it comes to ourselves and when interacting with others out in the world. This includes keeping ourselves in check regarding patterns like lying, manipulating, codepending, withholding, or pretending. Allowing ourselves to dream big without contaminating these dreams with judgments or perceived limitations or a lack of deserving. Taking responsibility for all of our experiences. Learning to set boundaries that protect and nurture our relationships with ourselves and others. Allowing ourselves to make mistakes and not berating ourselves for making them. Instead, we choose to appreciate our desire to learn and grow. Refusing to seek permission or approval to be ourselves. An unhealthy ego is like a shield, protecting us from the outside world, but also preventing us from loving ourselves and our lives. An unhealthy ego will tell you to stick to what's comfortable, to avoid uncertainty, and to have unrealistic expectations for yourself and others. An unhealthy ego is rooted in fear, anxiety, limiting beliefs, and toxic thinking patterns. A healthy ego is built on core beliefs that are based in love. An unhealthy ego is built on core beliefs that are based in fear. So, Fill up your cup first and only give from the overflow. We often leave the loving us to others, like partners, mothers, fathers, friends, dogs, and we blame them if they don't do it right. It's actually your job to learn how to love you. You are the only thing you're sure to keep for the rest of your life. Loving you is learning what is good to you, what empowers you, what brings you peace and joy. It's respecting your boundaries and showing others how to love you right. Love, that's what life is all about. Fill your cup first and only give from the overflow. Set boundaries. Know your limits. Recognize the red flags. Ask yourself, What do I really want? Learn to say no as a full sentence. Be conscious of your self-talk. Be conscious of what you eat and drink and put into your body. Take care of your body. Do your checkups. Stretch and exercise your body daily. Know what vitamins your body needs and what would make it healthier. Don't wait to be sick or have weird symptoms. Listen to your body. Recharge by walking in nature, hugging trees, breathing deep, fresh air. Meditate and feed your soul every morning before turning on your phone, email, or news. Learn to connect with your higher self. Learn to stay silent, present, and listen to your own breathing. Here are some affirmations. Now, affirmations might feel silly the first time you do them in a mirror, but it is proven that changing your own self-talk starts with the way that you talk to yourself. I see you, your true essence. I see who you really are. I respect you. I salute you. I love you. I honor you. I recognize you. I am more divine than human. My gut feeling is my new best friend. Ask yourself, do my choices incorporate harmony, 
sharing, cooperation, and reverence for life? Do my choices include intentions that honor my body, my relationships, my world, and most importantly, my own soul? Are the choices I'm making every day creating authentic power for me, which comes when my soul and personality are aligned? Or are my choices placing my power outside of myself, causing me to look to other people, places, and things for approval, power, and purpose? I can vividly remember my awakening to self-awareness. It was like a radical shift in my perspective. Now, I talk a lot about better vantage points or an aerial view of life, and that's self-awareness. When you're knee-deep in the forest, your perspective is narrowed. When you can look down on the same scene, you're able to pull more into the frame and get a better perspective. Problems shrink, and you can navigate the maze with new insight. You now see yourself and how you relate to others and to the world. But when you're slugging it out in the midst of chaos, you can only see what is right in front of you. Step back and question how this situation and your role impacts all facets and all relationships. And that's a start. Thomas Armstrong covers the stages of ego development according to Jane Lovinger, found at instituteforlearning.com. Jane Lovinger was an American psychologist working in the 20th century who focused on the idea of ego development across the lifespan. She created a theory of ego development based on nine consecutive stages. One can't skip stages in her theory, and the stages are pre-social or infancy, the baby which is at the mercy of the world around it and its own needs, really has no ego to speak of until it begins to differentiate itself from its caregivers and the demands of the outer environment. Moving into impulsive, the young child is driven by its emotions, including sexual and aggressive drives, and interprets caregiver responses in black and white terms as being either nice to me or mean to me. The world is good if their needs are met, or the world is bad if it doesn't. Self-protective. The child at this stage begins to develop some rudimentary self-control. They are caught up in perceiving the world in terms of punishments and rewards, but also incorporates the need to not get caught. Conformist. The child now becomes more aware of society and the need to belong to a group with its own biases and stereotypes, like gender groups. Good behavior is what is sanctioned by one's group and others outside the group are treated with suspicion. An important element in terms of cohesion to the group is a sense of trust in one's fellow members. Self-aware. Lovinger believed that this stage represents the model for most adult behavior, with few going beyond this stage before age 25. Here we see the beginnings of self-criticism and the ability to envision multiple possibilities in life events. There's an increasing awareness of the difference between the real me and the expected me. Conscientious. These individuals have internalized the rules of society, but they also acknowledge the existence of exceptions and special contingencies. The ego feels guilt for hurting others rather than feeling remorse at breaking the rules. The person at this stage sees life in terms of the choices that they make and the responsibility they take for their own actions. Individualistic. This stage includes a respect for individuality in oneself and a tolerance towards the individual differences in others. Autonomous. Achieving a sense of self-fulfillment becomes more important than outer achievements at this stage. There is a greater sense of self-acceptance and a deeper respect for the autonomy of others. Integrated. This stage is similar to Maslow's concept of self-actualization. The ego shows inner wisdom, deep empathy for others, and a high degree of self-acceptance. This is the stage of a fully formed and mature ego that cherishes individuality in self and others. 
Lovinger says that very few people make it to this stage. So which stage do you identify with? It's important to note that while ego-related issues can be challenging, they're not insurmountable. Therapy, self-reflection, and personal growth efforts can help individuals with out-of-control egos develop a healthier and more balanced sense of self. That's what we're going for. Recognizing the impact of one's ego on their behavior and relationships is often the first step toward positive change. But here's a side note. You can't fix other people. So if you're thinking of all these new techniques to get your loved one to see the error in their ways, take another step back. This knowledge will help you become more attuned and aware of the situation, but it's not a remedy for narcissism. Self-awareness only describes you. They have to become aware of their own sense of self. On the Holistic Psychologist YouTube channel, I found How to Do Ego Work from Dr. Nicole LaPera. Let's take a listen. Hi everyone, Dr. Nicole LaPera, the Holistic Psychologist here. First and foremost, this ego, we each have one. What is it? It's a part of our self-identity that has been internalized based on our very real lived experiences. For most of us, this begins in childhood. So I'm gonna use an example to illustrate. Say as a little child, we find something that just lights us up. We're so interested in it. Different for each of us. Some of us, it might be art. Some of us, sports, dancing, whatever. We are having, we find that thing and we have the experience of, you know, we're glowing, we're excited, and we're in the presence of one of our caregivers. And if that caregiver responds, maybe they don't respond at all. Maybe they just kind of ignore us and our excitement, or maybe as we approach and try to show them how excited we are, they're they're a little bit detached, they're not there. Maybe they even respond negatively. Negative could even mean, don't get too excited, calm down, don't yell, dad's sleeping. Or we're not interested in that. That's not who we are as a family. And I'm just throwing out many examples. As a little child, that hurts that causes a pain, that doesn't feel like we're accepted and that our interests are accepted in that moment. So what do we do? We are incredibly adaptive, so we learn. Meaning, chances are over time, we're gonna show interest in that particular thing or similar things less and less to avoid that same hurt. That's what we call as a shadow. Doesn't mean that that art or that dance or that music or whatever it is, isn't still part of who we are or our interest in that. Of course it is. It just means that we learn not to show up in the world because what we've registered is we don't get love in the way that we want love if we show up in the world with that. This could happen on the opposite end too, where because we're so attuned and adaptive as children, we learn the positive ways that we get unconditional love or acceptance or what we feel to be unconditional love and we learn how to show up as that. So for me, that became achievement, school, athletic. I learned that that's how I got the reception from my parents, the accolades and the validation, ultimately the love. Probably why I went to school for so goddamn long and got a PhD, but I do love the topic and I love the work I'm doing, but just an example. So that's how we carry that into adulthood. I became a human who really looked to seek validation in myself from achieving. So as part of my healing journey, I had to learn to get validation in other ways. Something I want you to understand as I'm going into what ego then work is, is our ego is protecting us. It is not something that we want to get rid of or kill or probably not even something that will ultimately go away. It's there for a reason and it becomes activated in moments to protect us, to keep us safe. So what is ego work then? Ego work is really a practice that takes time, but it's a practice of beginning to observe the ego as separate from the authentic self, to be able to separate who I really am, so the authentic me that contains all the positive things and all the things that I came to believe were a shadow of myself, coming to accept it all and to understand that the ego is there to protect me. So how do we begin? I love the practice of naming the ego. The act of naming it, so my ego's name happens to be Tiffany. So when I sense that Tiffany has been activated in my current life in any way, being able to label it in my mind, oh, there's Tiffany again, she's hurt, 
she doesn't feel accepted, she's wanting love, whatever it is that she's nagging about in that moment, giving her a name that's separate from me, it's not Nicole, helps me to understand that, oh, that's just separate from me, that Nicole is actually the person that I can cultivate the opportunity to make a new choice. So once I've named my ego and I can get used to identifying my ego and her responses in my life, I can begin to dive a bit deeper and I can ask myself, my ego is telling me a story that we really want to explore the, the story that my ego is telling us. So I'm going to shift away from me and throw out a really global example that I think will resonate for, with a lot of you, which is a lot of our egos tend to tell us stories that our thoughts, our ideas, our work isn't good enough, right? So once I dove down and I understand, oh, this is my ego, maybe she's critical in this moment, Tiffany's telling me all of the ways I'm not good enough, I can label that as Tiffany trying to protect me, right? And understand that that's where that's coming from. The story, if I were to believe the story, right, that my thoughts, my ideas, my work isn't good enough, how would I react? A couple ways. I might procrastinate. I might not show up at all. I might compare myself to a million other people. Obviously not comparing myself up, comparing myself down. I'm less than them, further evidence that I'm not good enough or not worthy in that way. Those are not helpful reactions to fulfill us maybe in the ways that we want to be fulfilled. Over time, if I release that story, right, if I can release the story of my thoughts, my ideas, my work not being good enough, I can make space for a new choice, a choice not to procrastinate, a choice to put my truth out into the world, a choice to stop comparing myself endlessly to others, and a choice to allow the authentic me, my light and my dark and everything in between to show up in this world. If you want to share Encouragementology with a friend who needs to know they're not alone in this journey of self-discovery, you can visit Encouragementology.com or anywhere you stream your content to receive this episode and all others. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram for additional encouragement throughout the week. So I challenge you, be open to self-reflection as you explore your thoughts, feelings, and motivations. A well-balanced ego is typically associated with a healthy sense of self-esteem, confidence, and resilience. I know you can do it. Thank you for listening to Encouragementology with Kendall Boyson, where we find positive ways to handle some of life's challenges. Someone through until the path was clear. That's when I found you. How I